I want to talk about uh, Iran since 2019. What is happening right now? And more importantly, it's about a new generation of indoctrinated elite. If you take a look at this three slides that I will show you, these slides are from the last meeting of Ayatollah Khamenei with the Iranian elite and official, the top elite and official, just two months ago. If you take a look closely, you will see almost every important elite, including you know, the president, I can already see, General Alibov, the speaker of the parliament, uh, the head of Iran judiciary. Then you have on this slide, you have the member of assembly of experts, the member of the guardian council, the member of the experience council. A closer look, you will see a few clerics, <coughs> military personnel, most importantly from the IRGC, Artesh IRGC police, but most of them come from the IRGC, and the civilian old elite, including Zarghami, uh, the foreign minister Abdullah Yan. These elites sitting in the front row are the old elite of the Islamic Republic. If you zoom to the back of the meeting, there are a few pictures you can see and you can find out about this elite. You will see a new picture of the Islamic Republic. Uh, for example, Mehrdad Baz Hosh, here, Ali Naderi, a lot of new faces that we didn't see among of the old Iranian political elite. My question is, who are these people? Where they are coming from? What's their idea and ideology? And what does it mean rising to the power for the Islamic Republic, for its policy, internal and external policy? I will talk very briefly about the Iran political elite from 1979 to now, but I will focus only on Iran after 2019 and talking about Imam Sadiq Iha, a university called Imam Sadr University, ISO, and its graduates. And then I will talk about what does it mean, this, in terms of the policy making and policy implementation. Okay, talk about the political elite. You know, since I'm not sure about the audience, how much they know, I put a slide about the you know, political elite approach. In political science, political sociology, one way for us to understand what is going on and predict the future is trying to understand who are the elite, the composition of the elite, the socioeconomic background of the elite. And then you have a better understanding and what is going on right now. And you can predict the future. So if you think about the Pahlavi era, that I'm not going to touch upon that, the familiar is here, I'm not going to embarrass myself. Very briefly, if you think about Iran under the monarchy, you have three different groups of the elite. You have the court, you have the army, and you have the group of the modern movement created by Reza Shah and then expanded under the Muhammad Reza Shah. 1979 revolution happened, and the whole structure of the elite and composition of the elite has changed. From 1979, under Ayatollah Khomeini, the court replaced by the clerical establishment. In the constitution, we accepted the velayat of faqih or the guardianship of the jurist theory. According to this theory, theory a grand marda, grand ayatollah, should rule the countries. Army was completely purged in several rounds, more than 12,000 high rank military commanders have been killed or executed or the country. To replace that, they created IRGC, Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps. First as a bodyguard of the cleric and later on became a force in order to maintain the political and social order and maintain the regime. During Iran Iraq war, the IRGC expanded from a small militia to three military branches. Army, Navy, and ground force. 
The last elite, bureaucracy, was also undermined under the Islamic Republic. For a few years, we had a period of debureaucratization of the Islamic Republic. They believed that the bureaucracy is a product of authoritarian dictatorship or hukumat tawuti tyrannical government, and they have to dismantle it. This actually came from the Iran constitution, that we need to dismantle the bureaucracy. We don't need the bureaucracy. In the sense of the bureaucracy, we can create a revolutionary institution to implement the policy. After two years of purification of the bureaucracy undermined it, they realize they cannot actually manage and control the government, so they go back again to the bureaucracy. But this time, they try to control the bureaucracy through the political screening, through two mechanisms of ideological selection and surveillance through the harassment. I'm actually I'm writing an article on the harassment or protection unit in Iran bureaucracy. So the Iran elite was overthrown, changed under the Ayatollah Khomeini. He died in 1989, and Ayatollah Ali Khamenei became the leader. Under his leadership, we have five different administrations. The first administration, the Hashemir Afsanjani administration, you have two politicians almost equal weight. You know, Hashemir Afsanjani was the man who made Ayatollah Khamenei as a leader in a very manipulative engineer session. During Hashemi Rafsanjani, the power was divided between Hashemi who controlled the state bureaucracy, he had a very bureaucratic mentality, and Ayatollah Khamenei who had a security military mentality. <coughs> because of the importance of the Hashemi Rafsanjani, Khamenei didn't touch the bureaucracy first, focused on the military, on IRGC, and the clerical establishment. His first initiative was purging IRBC, the Revolutionary Guard, from any opposition elite, mostly from the Islamic leftists that were supporting Ayatollah uh, Hussein Ali Muntaziri, and intensifying indoctrination to make sure that IRBC is personalized, is only supporting him and his regime. The second time, he tried to control the clerical, to seminary, a school. The problem was Ayatollah Khamenei was a middle rank clergy. He didn't have a religious credential or charisma like Ayatollah Khamenei. But he started to regularize, bureaucratize the seminary school. He tried to buy the loyalty. Some of the grand Ayatollah actually support him. They receive some incentive and they support him like Makarem Shirazi, like Ayatollah Nuri Ahmedani. Some of them, like Muntazari and Azari Akumi, were opposed actually to the Khamenei, and he used the coercion to silence them. He tried to control the clerical network. Under the Khatami, the story became a little bit more interesting. You know, in 1997, Ayatollah Khamenei supported the conservative candidate, but people voted for the smiley face clergy that talk about the political liberalization, civil society. During this time, the gap between Ayatollah Khamenei, who intended to control all aspects of the regime, and reformists start to get wider and wider. In 1999, a student protest happened in Tehran, and as a result of that, the IRGC actually threatened reformists and Muhammad al-Khatami, that if you don't stop them, we are coming after them. They threaten for a good attack. During this time, there is a gap that's very visible between the deepest state and visible state. This concept of the deepest state starts to emerge during the Khatami. The reformists and their agenda actually was a challenge to Ayatollah Khamenei. During this time, he published his first manifesto, very important manifesto, that almost nobody you know, cares about that, but we are going to see everything that happened 
is actually based on this theory. There was a gap between Khatamian reformists and Ayatollah Khamenei and his allies. Ayatollah Khamenei and his allies are the Islamists, if I want to simplify. Islamists want to implement Sharia inside of the country. Islamists believe that Islam has a plan for the politics. Islamists believe that Islam is also our ideology in addition to the religion. Khatamian reformists start to move from this picture. They were became closer to the idea of the post-Islamism. That Islam should not be imposed from the top, should be grow from the bottom. So Ayatollah Khamenei in 1999 publishes the First Manifesto that what the reformists are telling is not right. You know, we just started our plan. According to Ayatollah Khamenei, we had the 1979 revolution. In 1982, we consolidated the power, created the Islamic, Islamic regime, but we still have three steps to fulfill. We have not done that. We don't have the Islamic government or Islamic administration. Islamic government should actually create an Islamic society, and Islamic society, when the, the, became, the, the society became Islamic, it will be a model to create an Islamic ummah. How many, if you go and find out, if you search what he's talking and the speech, he actually talked about this stuff from 1989 onward, but very scattered. In 1999, he put everything together and published as the first manifesto. He believed that the Khatami and Hashemi Rafsanjani administration are not Islamic administration, and we have to, we have to, jump to the third phase of the revolution. 2005, he believed that he has done that. Ahmadinejad became the president, and Ayatollah Khamenei prized his government as the best administration since 1905 constitutional revolution. For five years, there was a honey. President and the leader worked hand to hand to implement social and political changes. They fired a lot of bureaucrat, technocrat. They hired a lot of people from the Basis and the Revolutionary Guard. For the first time, they are coming as a technocrat to work with the state administration. But since 2010, after the Green Movement started, this story has completely changed. There was a gap between Ahmadinejad and Ayatollah Khamenei. And there are a lot of theory about that. And I really asked you know, if there was any student my suggestion was to go and study why there was a gap in 2010 between Ahmadinejad and the president, Ayatollah Khamenei. There are some theories. One of my theories is, you know, both of these people have the same character and personality. Both of them are populists. You know, there is a saying in Farsi that you can, 100 Darwish can sleep on one rock, but two chin cannot rule one country. So these two were seen as a king, they couldn't actually work together. There were other you know, idea, the personality of Ahmadinejad, the influence of the reformists and, 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 and Hashemi Rafsanjani and pragmatism. But it's not our talk right now, you know, the topic of our talk. What is important is the first attempt for creation of the Islamic society failed. During the Ahmadinejad, we had the second cultural revolution. Most of the people from the university were fired. Uh, the bureaucracy was completely purged in the higher rank. And I told how many thought that this is happening. We are going to have the Islamic State. It didn't work out. 2013, Rouhani became the president. There are again the question, why? If I told how many believed this past, why he accepted Hassan and Rouhani? The answer, I think, is because of the international sanction that the Obama started and put the Iranian economy in a very bad situation. And don't forget, Ayatollah Khamenei doesn't have too much ally. Ahmadinejad became the opposition. Hashemir Afsan, Jonia Reform is also opposing him. So he decided to let Rouhani to try this path to go and remove the sanction to solve the Iran nuclear program in hope that later on he go back to his Plan. During Hassan Rouhani, actually, again, the gap between deep state and the visible state was very, very clear. 
we have a late uh, leaked uh, video ta uh, thing from Jawad Zarif who are talking that you know the DPC doesn't let us work. The DPC actually Soleimani is working for the Russian. The Russian doesn't want us to reach the negotiation. During this time, Ayatollah Khamenei and IRGC has another concern. Between 2013 to 2017, the first period of Hassan al-Rouhani, he removed the sanction, he, he actually reached the uh, deal with the US and 5 plus 1, and the Iranian economy started to grow. This created a sense of threat among of the hardliners, Ayatollah Khamenei and IRGC, that if Hatan Rouhani continues this path, he can be a, another successor to Ayatollah Khamenei. He can convince people, and some people in the elite, that he is able to manage and rule. I think that's a very important threat, that since Hatan Rouhani's second period started in 2017, IRGC started to put the pressure to vandalize Hassan al Rouhani initiative. Then you have 2018, President Trump withdrawing of the deal and imposing the sanction, and everything that the Hassan al Rouhani fought for it collapsed in 2018. Sanctions are coming back. The IRGC and the hardliner are putting the pressure more and more because they don't want Hassan Rouhani to become the next supreme leader. And his administration is all inefficient and corrupt. Mismanagement, corruption is very pervasive among all, the all political elite, including the, the, the reformists and moderates and centralists. It was the end of 2019 that Ayatollah Khamenei came back to this idea that if the deal doesn't work anymore, if the Trump withdraw from the deal and the, all of the sanctions are coming back, it's time again for me to change the political system. 2019, he published the second manifesto called The Second Phase of the Revolution. It's five pages, but it's very difficult to read. It's a propaganda in the nature. If you want to torture your students, please ask them to read that. <laughs> it's very, very difficult to read. But the whole message of this text is trying to renew the Islamic Republic through to bringing a new blood, the younger generation of the elite. He believed that the problem that we start in the third phase, we cannot Islamize the state or administration is the political elite, the corrupt old, revolu old uh, 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 generation of the elite. He asked for creation of the Hezbollah young government. If you go back to what happened since 2019 to now and read the political transformation, you will realize everything happened based on this manifesto. Since 2019, Ayatollah Khamenei started to appoint a new generation of the younger elite. First, in the institution that he controlled directly, non-elected body. He controlled Iran TV, he controlled Iran military, he controlled a lot of financial institutions, he controlled Islamic propagation organization. He replaced his representative at the universities with the younger elite. Almost all of these people were less than 40, 45 years old. And these clerics were all of them were direct students of Ayatollah Khamenei. Mm -hmm. After he did that, in 2020, we had a parliamentary election. He manipulated the whole system, the whole election. And in the election, the result was creation, what he called a revolutionary parliament. Get rid of, of the you know, reformist, moderate, or the old version, and bring a new one. In 2021, he finished the story 
but imagine how they think the presidential election. It was one of the most engineered elections in the history of the Islamic Republic that had a long history of engineered election. Even Ali Larijani, one of the most brutal people who died in Muhammad, he was disqualified. Everybody was disqualified because they wanted to bring Michael Larijani and create this Islamic government or administration. The loud participation doesn't really matter. You know, in Iran, political participation, especially in the presidential election, is high. In 2009, it was about more than 85% as the climate. It was always more than 60%. But as you can see in the parliamentary election 2021 and presidential election 22, they managed, they manipulate the election. And they knew that the people are going to buy it, or many people are not going to participate, but that's not the really case. So, 2021, the presidential election finished. Ayatollah Raisi became the Iran president. We have a revolutionary parliament, and all of the non elected organizations are controlled by the new elite. But who are these elites? Take a look at all of this picture. There are a lot of similarities. He is the governor of Tehran. He is the deputy of the uh, IR, IBR, Iran TV. They are the minister of Abdul Abdulmaliki, the minister of uh, labor, the minister of economy. All of them are very young. That's one. All of them look like each other with bare mustache. So, so, you know, such like a cult. But if you go and study the characteristic of these people, and we did that, find out who came to the power and try to understand the socio-economic background of these people. You know, there is a very good book by Dr. Mehrza de Burujadi on political elite after the post-revolutionary era. There is a very good book by the late Marvin Zonis on the Pahlavi era. But uh, the book of the Mehrza de Burujadi and uh, another of the uh, Dr. Aga Khan, if I'm not mistaken, I'm not sure. They finished in 2018-2019. They have not studied the new elite. Most of these people are born after the revolution. Most of these people are coming from the families of Isar Garan or devotee. The Isar Garan or devotee is a concept that the Islamic Republic using usually for four groups of the people. Family of the martyr, family of the prisoner of the war, during the Iran of war. Uh, the martyr can be the, the during Iran of war or after that, you know, in, in Syria or in Yemen. Uh, the people who generally are the member of the Basij, active member of the Basij, and the last uh, one, everybody who's supporting the Islamic Republic. Some of them are not member of the Basij or member of the family of the martyr or, or uh, the veteran of Iran or war. But still, they got the, 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 the label of the Isar Gera. Interestingly enough, most of this new elite had a membership of the Basit, a student, university student, became one of the centers that train and bring these people as a channel. There are other universities and institutions that many of these elite came from. One of these is among other universities that we published an article a few months ago, two or three months ago, and after that, the Camilla invited me to come and talk about that paper. And we are going to talk about it. So all of these elites are young, all of these elites are close to Ayatollah Khamenei. And the idea, most of these elites have the membership of the Basij, the student Basij organization. This elite, if you think about it, you know, at the top of the uh, pyramid is the office of Ayatollah Khamenei, the Beitar Ahmed is an organization about 4,000 people working with this office 
and managing more than 200 different institutions and organizations. It's a polar of the state bureaucracy. Almost every state bureaucracy organization has a polar in the office of Ayatollah Khamenei, literally. On the bottom, you have uh, both elected and non-elected. That is dominated by the older elite, by the cleric, by the revolutionary guard, and the old civilian. They are replacing the top politically appointed with the young group of the elite. If you remember, I told you that one organization that producing training and producing this, pumping this new elite is the University of Amazon, ISU. If you take a look at the political elite, new political elite, you will realize the, the Iran negotiator right now, Bakar Yekani, is the graduate of ISU. The Iran Minister of Labor, the Iran Minister of Finance, the, the head of the Central Bank, the head of the administrative organization, the head of the Tehran uh, stock market, in the media, Imam Sadiq has graduate at the top as a deputy and as the sub uh, manager of each channel. You have uh, the minister, uh, deputy minister of uh, interior, you have the deputy minister, uh, deputy of the president in, in relation with the parliament, you have the deputy minister in a sport. The list is very, very long. But all of these people have been graduated from one university that we have not heard too much about that. It's Imam Saleh University. Imam Saleh University, or ISU, actually was created in 1971-72 by the late Mahmoud Lajabadi, Lajabadi, to create the bureaucrat and manager for the Pahlavi rapid growing bureaucracy. Based on the Harvard educational system, it was supposed to train the manager in less than one year. The curriculum was based on the Harvard, they learned in English. It was very modern university. After the revolution, the clergy confiscated like everything else. And from 1982, they opened the door. They believe that the Western modern universities in Tehran, in Iran, they are not training the Islamic enough, ideologically enough, technocrat. They need something else. So they created the universities that is a combination of the seminary a school and the modern university. In Imam Tadak universities, that is only focusing on social science humanities. Every major, like political science, come with Islamic studies. Economy and Islamic studies, political science and Islamic studies, uh, sociology and Islamic studies. You have to study Islamic courses as well as the modern courses, modern social sciences. About 100 unit you have to spend on general ideological classes. The whole idea from the beginning was to train a new version of the elite for the Islamic Republic. Again, don't forget the Islamic Republic from the beginning, don't trust the bureaucracy. They believe that the bureaucracy is product of the Pahlavi monarchy and should be dismantled. Getting into the Amsterdam University is very difficult. You not only have to take the academic exam, you have to have an ideological interview, and then you have a neighborhood investigation. They are coming to your home, they are coming to your neighborhood, asking a lot of questions, especially they are going to your home to see if you, know, you have a satellite dish or you don't have it, what kind of the book you are reading. In ideological interview, they're asking you a lot of questions to, to see what is your social background, social economic background. If you have any Western-oriented, you know, uh, background, or if you are somehow 
or align with that idea. One of the questions was, uh, uh, who is Sadiq Hidayat? Do you know Sadiq Hidayat? Sadiq Hidayat was a very famous Iranian writer. When you get into the ISU, it's not like every university. It's very like a small soft cult. You don't get out of the universities regularly. You live with your peers. You have a lot of extra program activities, mostly ideological content, listening to the a speech of the clergy, participating in the revolutionary activities. Are women allowed? Sorry? Women. Uh, there are two branches separate. The women branches started in 1992, 93, sorry, 1987, but the men uh, branches started in 1982. They are completely separated. Uh, they don't, uh, the women branches don't have any male employee or faculty members or even you know, staff. Everything is done by women. The men, are also completely gender segregated. ISU from the beginning was created with this goal to train the ideological elite. But if you go and study the history of ISU, in the first decade, they have only a student. They don't have any faculties, trusted, trustworthy faculties. During this time, Hossein Bashir did, Bahlawan, the you know, very liberal oriented professors are teaching at ISU. Why? Because they don't have any professor who teach the social model, social science. They are teaching at the university at the same time the students are exposed to the Islamic studies. The second period, the ISU graduate are replacing this professor. All of these people have not been allowed to teach in the second decade. They replace them with their own graduates. They send a lot of graduates to the Europe, to the France, Belgium, to get the PhD and come back. They didn't hire all of them. They just hired the most royal. During the Khatami, the ISU graduates are coming to teach at the different universities. Now they teach at their own road uh, at ISU and then they are trying to control other universities. At Alameda our, our universities, at Tehran universities. Ahmadinejad era was the first time that actually ISU tried to get into the SA administration, a SA program. Ahmadinejad hired some of these people. But again, ISU still is young. Is not very ready to do that. Under the Rohani, because Rohani didn't trust these universities, almost all of the uh, graduates went and worked with the non elected institutions that are controlled by Ayatollah Khamenei, like Iran uh, TV and radio, like Excellency Council. It was only on the right of race that we are witnessing the emerge of ISU graduate in not only the non-elected institution, but elected institution. Almost every minister, every state institution are dominated by politically appointed ISU member. So, if you remember, I told you that the Islamic Republic has three pillars, that Ayatollah Khamenei tried to personalize, control them. In the first decade after 1919, it was a, a military and, uh, and security, or IRGC, that Ayatollah Khamenei controlled that, purged everybody that holds him, <coughs> intensified in the he, 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 he asked for the clergy, to, to train a more indoctrinated people, although not everybody is indoctrinated, without any doubt. We're talking about 180,000 members of IRGC. Not everybody is indoctrinated. There are a lot of hypocritical 
you know, people who just pretend to be induction indicator. I will talk about that. I have a slide for that. The clerical elite, I told you how many tried to control from 1990 and gradually did, was successful to do that through the creation of some universities that we are not heard about it, like Imam Khomeini University by Ayatollah Mesbah or IBU, Imam Bagal Universities. For this talk, we will focus only on technocratic elite that the ISU are pushing these people. So, but the Isar Garan are part of the Iran societies. As I told you, the prisoner of war, veteran, family of the martyr, siege members. They are shaping a, a society inside of the society, what I call the deep society. And out of that, these institutions are hiring these people and pushing them to the state. Bureaucracy to the clerical network to, to not everybody in clerical is supported to harmony. We know that. We have actually a lot of opposition among the clerics. But this cleric doesn't have too much power. They are not working with their state. Or we don't, uh, some of the, you know, some people believe that the Iranian Akhtesh is not as indoctrinated as IRGC. And that's true to some extent, especially in the lower file and rank. But they don't have too much power. Power is not. So this is happened since 2019. But if you remember, if you want to understand what is happening based on that table how many developed in 1999, Islamic administration is just a beginning of another phase, Islamization of society. Interestingly enough, somebody asked Ayatollah Khamenei, we had Islamic society in 1999, 1991. And he said, no, Islamic society is not established. We have to implement Islamic Sharia and Islamic rule and Islamic mentalities inside of the society. We have not done that. In spite of all of this, in a, slow, in a spite of two different rounds of the cultural revolution, 1981 and 2005, 2009. If you... The whole idea of this plan was creation of the Islamic state, Islamic government. And it's a very big idea. What does it mean? Ayatollah Khamenei defined it that Islamization of not only a state institution, a state agency, a state executive, a state agent, everybody should be Islamic. And what does it mean? Islam should be uh, the, the, the world view of these people. When they are coming to the world, they have to just think about you know, uh, respecting Islam, defending Islam. Some people even define the, 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 the ideology of the regime as a dini or religious prejudice. That if you defend your religion, you are ideologic. So please don't think about, you know, the, 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 uh, the leftist idea of the ideology that is very close, uh, uh, very a fair idea. Again, if you want to torture your student or punish them for any reason, ask them to read this document. This document, published three months ago, and there is no news, even in English, about this. You know, in English, there is only one uh, news on the Iranian side about. This is the document that published by Ayatollah Raisi administration. 240 pages. Very difficult to read. If you listen to Ayatollah you realize he cannot speak even Farsi. And imagine, you know, the whole administration, how they are reading this document. I read it and, you know, I, I'm not a psychopath, but I have to read this stuff. It's very ideologic in, in terms of the content, but the whole idea is we create this administration and this administration is working based on this uh, values and norms. The family oriented is going to create the Islamic society and we are going to do that. We are going to engineer 
and uh, uh, reform or change every aspect of the life, including, you know, material and internal. Everything, cooking, living in, uh, in uh, you know, in, living uh, in apartment, for example, should be based on Islamic rule and regulation and idea. For example, you know, maybe you ask, what does it mean? In modern apartment, we don't have the space between the kitchen and the living room. It's an open space. But it's not Islamic, because if your wife or mother is working in the kitchen, and you have a guest, somebody can see her. So it's not Islamic. It seems crazy, and I know that. And many maybe said, you know, this is for internal consumption. But in reality, when you look at the history of the Islamic Republic from 1979 to now, you will realize all of these crazy ideas have been implemented. Some of them subtly, some of them very explicitly. So, based on that, you are hearing a lot of news about a new wave of gender separation in the park. The Tehran mayor said, we are creating the park specifically for the government. You are hearing the story about the expelling of the faculty at the university. I wrote a very short piece on the third cultural revolution in Iran. You are hearing about the intensification of moral policy. These are not a scattered policy. Some crazy people are doing that. That's one way to look at it. You know, for example, thinking about the banning bikini wax in Russia, this seems very crazy, really. you know. Maybe there is one crazy guy who ordered that. But if you put everything together, you see a better picture of where we are standing. It doesn't mean that they are going to be successful, not at all. They have already failed, and they are going to fail or miserably. But the beauty of the Islamic Republic is they never ever stop trying. And that thing I like about them. They fail and fail and fail, and they're doing it and doing it and doing it. Hopefully someday they believe it will work. One of this plan, the Internet Protection Bill, that is in the problem. And I want to say that. Please go for the Farsi speaker. Go to the parliament, Iran parliament uh, study center and see all of the bill that they have been approved or proposed since 2019 to now. You will be surprised to see how many ideological bills is going on. The creation of this uh, organization for counter intelligence of, of judiciary. The reviewing the process of the selection of the state employee. There are a lot of ideological bills they are proposing and they are working on, including this one, cutting up Iran out of the internet, creating an internal intranet that work in Iran if you are inside of the country, it's accessible to every website inside of the country, but outside of the country it will be more expensive and more difficult to do that. And if they need it, they can actually shut it down and cut it. The consequences. I'm not sure how much time do I have. Online. Sorry? Online. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I loved you already. <laughs> if you're tired, please say it. What does it mean, really? What is the consequences? We had a discussion with Dr. Miller just a few, uh, you know, hours ago over that. You know, I. I, I, I really believe, if you think about the Islamic Republic, what Islamic, what's the nature of the Islamic Republic? This is a question that Iranian political science and most of, you know, the non-Iranian political science try to answer from the Islamic democracy to a totalitarian regime. Some call it totalitarian, some call it authoritarian, to, uh, theocratic regime, hybrid regime. Uh, Larry Diamond, for example, uh, before 2009, called it a hybrid regime. Autocratic regime. What kind of animal it is? I prefer to say it is an idocracy. Idocracy is not actually my cone, it's a German uh, political scientist who wrote 
about idiocracy and compare the Nazi Germany, Soviet Union, and Eastern European Marxist countries. In the idiocracy, a state has an idea that every policy that they are taking and implementing is based on that. It's much softer than totalitarian regimes because they are not able to implement that because they don't have the uh, you know, police state, because they don't have the, the, some of them, they don't have the uh, t uh, terror, they don't use the violence too much or very, very visible violence, but they are based on the ideology. If you think about the Islamic Republic, you know, the hijab, for example, think about the hijab. Almost nobody in Iran really respects the hijab anymore, among of the younger generation. They have to wear something, but some of them are actively defiant, some of them are passively defiant. They have a very different form of the hijab right now, but the Islamic Republic doesn't want to accept its failure. Or Islamization of society or government. It's a failure policy after 42 years, after 43 years. But they still they are working on it. The result of the idocracy is idocracy, without any doubt. Have you seen the movie Ido Crossing in 2006, American movie? Two uh, ordinary people asleep after five years, they are wake up and they realize they are most brilliant mind in the planet. Everybody else is almost as stupid. <laughs> it's the same story in Iran. When you marginalize the elite, when you make the situation so hard that everybody wants immigrants, Two out of three of the Iranian university students and professors wants to immigrate. This is a statistic of two days ago. You will come up, you will start with a bunch of idiots. I want to show a picture, but because Franco told me don't do that, I'm not going to do that. Have you heard about the story? Have you, have you heard about the story of the three cheetah in Iran? You know, the Iranian cheetah or ACSC cheetah is, is an endangered uh, species. So they find one in captivity, he had, she had three cubs. That's it, they announced that three female cubs was born. Two days later said, sorry, they were not female, they were male cubs. And they Keep them with the hand so the mother don't accept their cops. Two of them already died, and I heard today that the last one has died too. Oh. Yeah, it's really high, you know. When you put the idiot in a power, the result is deterioration of the Iranian life. Economically, Iranian studies just publish a book that you can go and see. The inflation right now is very, very high. Why? Because when you put the idiot as a responsible for <coughs> economic surgery, the result is disastrous. Without any doubt. When you put the idiot in a power, and I'm, you know, unfortunately we are going to put this online. So <laughs> when you put the idiot in the, in, in the power, you have this picture that the IRGC commander are showing you. A, a tool, a device, that we find a device to discover the coronavirus, nobody can find it. And two days later, they realized that somebody actually deceived them. This was uh, toys. They had a conference, and the IRGC commander showed that the, our passage members create this innovation. If you put the idiot in the power, you got a very hypocritic People. This guy, his name is Nershad Soyli. He is a teenager, right now 17 years old. He has started from 14 years old, a start to embezzle with the name of the Basij and IRDC. And he really let them do that. If you put the ideologic idiot in power, this will happen. Listen, please.
Okay. Have you heard that? The, the Venezuelan minister met the Iranian oil minister. And they have a negotiation. And Iranian oil minister said, yes to the America. Even the Venezuelans said, don't say that. When you put the ideologic idiot person in power, that he doesn't really don't know anything except the ideological frame. The last thing that I want to say, and you know, this slide of the, of the suppression. The, another way of the protest started in around a few days ago, and it's, it still is going on, but you know, in, not in the big cities. And they have been brutally suppressed. If you remember, in 2019, there was a protest in Iran, and in two days, the Islamic Republic killed at least 213 people. This is the statistic of the Islamic Republic. The statistic of other is 1,500. Just think about it. What kind of animal can you raise and train that they kill 213 people? Let's accept the Islamic Republic argument in two days. So the violence became justified by the ideology, dehumanize others, and it's much easier to beat or kill others. The last thing that I want to talk, and I will stop and will answer your question. I'm sorry. And it's thought for, for, for food for thought. Uh, these are the two tweets that Iranian put and published on the Twitter. If you compare the beginning of the era and the end of this century, from somebody like Mohammed Ali and his administration, and even, you know, uh, the Reza Shah, that without any doubt was a dictator, there is no doubt about that, but uh, you know, both in it. And put it with the RAC, some Iranian put this, and I will translate that, that from, uh, in, you know, from uh, 100 years, we came from the Muhammad Ali Fruhi, that was a very brilliant prime minister, to the Ibrahim RAC, from the elite like Ali Akbar to somebody like, you know, we, we actually we go back <laughs> very, very drastically compared you know, 100 years ago. Again, I don't want to defend the Russian government, although I believe you cannot even compare that administration with, with the Islamic Republic. There is no doubt about that. But in terms of the elite that the Russian relied on, and compared to this elite that they are running the country right now, we actually went backward. And that's a sad story. Thank you very much for your patience.